yeah, there's a lot of top 10 lists everywhere on YouTube, but this one's gonna beat them all cold. Cause this is the list of the top one inventions that revolutionized mankind. So you know your body is made up of chemicals. Well, about half of the nuclei in your body are hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe. In fact, it's one of those amazing things that by atom percent, your body is actually not that different in composition than the sun. Your body is about 65 atom percent hydrogen, while the sun is some 90 atom percent hydrogen. Just so we're clear, what is atom percent? So if I would take all the nuclei in your body and just count them up into what percent is, say for instance, hydrogen, that would be the atom percent of hydrogen. So your body is about 65 atom percent hydrogen. Of what's left, about 26 atom percent is oxygen. And from this, you can instantly see that your body is mostly made up of water. Water being H2O, so that would be 66 atom percent hydrogen, 33 percent oxygen. Of what's left, about 6 atom percent is carbon, and 1.5 percent is nitrogen. About half, half of the nitrogen in your body started off in a chemical reactor like this, a big steel tube at temperatures that would burn you. And pressures more like what you would get on Venus. And the pressures on Venus are about a hundred times what they are on Earth. And here on Earth, atmospheric pressure is not to be sniffed at. It's about 10 tons per square meter. Meaning that the nitrogen in your body started off at at least 1,000 tons per square meter. Now it's a comment that I commonly get, that I debunk junk science article after junk science article. It seems that almost everyone out there is making these wild promises and delivering nothing, or almost nothing. It's all broken promises based on snake oil. Empty dreams sold on science jargon by people who really don't understand any of what they're reporting. Otherwise, they would know that it's bullshit. Will a new device soon be the demise of the American food industry? Can a piece of technology change what you decide to eat? If you haven't heard, Telspec is a brand new handheld device which uses a low-powered laser to determine nutrient content, calories, chemicals, allergens, and ingredients in any food. You may think it's too good to be true, but here I am, sitting on the proof. This chair is made from air carbon, a material that's doing its part to protect the Earth's ever-warming climate. They fire up the engines, they pull the supports down, so this stays completely in the same place, but there's all this magnetism that's saving everybody while the Earth is shaking wildly under it. The Earth is like, okay, I'm done. The supports come back up, everything's good. So we were like, of course, you could probably, with a million engines, lift anything, but that's gotta cost a fortune. $13.10, that's what we're talking about what it would take to hover a house energy-wise. So people keep asking me, can I please, please, just for once, cover some science that really delivers? Well, God is this a science story that delivers. You see, it turns out one of the most important biological components of your body is nitrogen. It's there in proteins, in DNA, RNA, and lipids. Almost every component of your body contains nitrogen. Now, it turns out that nitrogen is actually fairly abundant in the atmosphere of the Earth. About 80% of the air that you're currently breathing is nitrogen. So, what is the problem I hear you ask? If the Earth's full of nitrogen, why do we need some fancy process to get it into our bodies? Well, it turns out that getting nitrogen into something that's biologically available, a form that your body can actually use, is exceptionally hard. The barriers are large. In Middle Earth terms, Mordor and Gondor might be on exactly the same level. That would basically be biologically available nitrogen and gaseous nitrogen. The reason that it's really hard to get from Gondor to Mordor is there is a big range of mountains in the middle. That's the rate limiting step of getting nitrogen from the air into a biological form that your body can actually use. And it's really tough. In fact, there are only a few microorganisms that can do it. And the biologically available nitrogen that they produce is one of the primary limits on how much plants can grow. So the bottom line is, all the biologically available nitrogen in your body comes 
from plants, either directly or indirectly. And this transformation from atmospheric nitrogen to biologically available nitrogen is so tough that it's actually one of the key rate limiting steps for how much plant life there can be on Earth, which also determines how much other life there can be on Earth. Enter stage left, a big metal tube that runs at high pressure and high temperature that can turn atmospheric nitrogen into biologically available nitrogen. And it's so successful that it's utterly revolutionized mankind and is arguably responsible for there now being 6 billion people being fed on the earth rather than 1 billion. It's utterly revolutionized mankind, arguably the most important discovery in mankind's history. You see, in the age of smartphones and Nike trainers, people have forgotten what the world is actually like. Well, it's not so much they've forgotten what it's like, they've just never experienced a world without science. A world which doesn't have supermarkets full of food. Mankind eked along for thousands of years on a more traditional version of this planet, where the levels of competition were so intense that you were always on the edge of survival. Death wasn't just something that happened to people in old age, it was a regular visitor. I mean, even after the revolution of agriculture, you know, but before the invention of mass-produced fertilizer, famine was a real thing. Crops failed, people starved. Now, the combination of modern fertilizer and the internal combustion engine means that about 2% of the people produce ample food for all, or mostly all. Science was a game changer here. And this is one of the reasons why I don't get too involved with haggling with people over politics. People have haggled over that sort of thing for hundreds of years, you know, left or right. Basically the line over how much stuff government should run. People always do it with an adamant surety that they understand politics and no one else does. All for little tangible gain. I mean, certainly nothing, nothing compared to half the nitrogen in your body being down to a single chemical process. I mean, you really just can't dodge how much this single process has impacted the life of everyone on Earth. Science, the understanding of the universe, delivered this. It's why about half the people watching this video will be doing it on a mobile device that would have made the sci-fi of the 60s. Library, computer, history files. Hell, the sci-fi of the 90s. Well, mm -hmm. <sighs> everything checks out. I was hoping you were going to find a flaw. Nope. So then you agree with our conclusion. Mm -hmm. It's inescapable. Seem clunky and out of date. The reimagined camera radically slows down time, capturing the moment within the moment. Its incredible 960 frames per second records four times faster Oh yeah, science delivers, and in this case, it starts with heating nitrogen and hydrogen to make ammonia. It's called the Haber process, or the Haber process. Not surprisingly, the guy got a Nobel Prize for it, and there's now a research institute that bears his name. Now, clearly, not all ideas can revolutionize mankind. But it's just this sad thing that people's idea of what science is has been so distorted by these wild, unrealistic promises by clickbait articles that at the end of this, people really don't have a realistic idea of what science looks like. But oddly enough, well, not so oddly, it's obvious when you think about it. No one really knows which discoveries will revolutionize civilization before they're made. As a great scientist once said, we wouldn't call it science if we knew what we were doing. Two great examples being semiconductor transistors, which really was an obscure niche discovery that now powers almost all of the computers on Earth. Or liquid crystals, an even more obscure and niche field that now runs the display of almost every electronic smartphone and computer on Earth. Hell, the entire field of antibiotics was started by a chance discovery by a guy who didn't do his washing up. Science is primarily about understanding the universe and exploring what you don't understand. And this is a window into that. This is what it actually looks like. And that's a nice touch. It's going to feature looking at ammonia at the Fritz Haber Institute. Now, liquid ammonia itself looks almost exactly like liquid water, creepily so. 
Indeed, it shares many common properties with water, most notably the huge amount of energy it takes to boil the stuff. Which is, of course, because both liquids are really strongly held together by hydrogen bonds. So practically, to boil water, you have to break about two hydrogen bonds per molecule, which costs an amazing two million joules per kilogram. Now, ammonia is a kind of similar sized molecule, but only has one hydrogen bond per molecule. So it takes about half the energy to boil it, about one million joules per kilogram, which is still crazy high. I mean, let's just put this into perspective with liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is not held together by these really strong hydrogen bonds, so it takes a mere 200,000 joules per kilogram to boil it. Give or take one tenth of the energy that it takes to boil water. However, the boiling point of liquid ammonia is well below room temperature. It's about minus 30 Celsius, which conveniently is also about minus 30 Fahrenheit. So here I have my tube with ammonia. If I actually just blow my ammonia into this pot here, absolutely diddly squat happens until I sort of stick it into the liquid, um, the ethanol dry ice bath, at which point you should find you start to get stuff condensing in there. It does actually condense really quite quickly. Um, and yeah, that's basically liquid ammonia. There are various ways I can demonstrate that this is actually liquid ammonia. Uh, the Maybe the simplest is I'll just pour it into another little ampule. And just how quickly it boils off, you see. But this is actually still quite cold. So what we can do is we're gonna get some microjets with liquid ammonia and spray them into a vacuum chamber, then hit that with an X-ray beam and smash some electrons off it and measure the energy of those electrons. Photoelectron spectroscopy, as it's technically called. And then we're gonna explore one of the most bizarre things in chemistry, which is ammonia. Liquid ammonia dissolves some metals to give metallic solutions. And it really doesn't happen anywhere else in all of chemistry like this. But you dissolve some alkali metals into ammonia and you get these gold solutions that actually conduct electricity about as well as silver. And this is just super weird and really not that well understood. Now that might not sound so bad, but it's actually a minefield of practical difficulties. One of the first being is you can't pump too much liquid into your vacuum chamber because otherwise it'll evaporate and it'll trash your vacuum. So the jet has to be very small, smaller than a human hair. Now human hairs vary in width, but mine are about a hundred or so microns. That's one tenth of a millimeter. Now our jets need to be somewhat smaller than this. So how can you make a jet that small? Now you can just buy silica jets like this for about 200 or so euros, but that presents the prospect of a very harsh and expensive learning curve, given the practical difficulties of making liquid ammonia microjets in a vacuum. It's just this nightmarish confluence of making things that are very small, very fast moving. I mean, these jets come out at like 50 or so miles per hour. So this is the core problem. That's a professionally made nozzle, cost about 200 euros, and it weighs about a third of a gram, give or take. So it's about $600 per gram for a professionally made nozzle. Now this is the real problem, is this is pure gold. That's one gram of pure gold, which costs about $50. Meaning that the nozzle here is about 10 times more expensive than gold. So, seeing as a single piece of dirt will actually block one of these, what you really need is a good cheap way of being able to make these. So this here is borosilicate glass, which is a much lower melting version of this. This is made of silica, it looks similar, but it's actually quite different. But the thing is, this is like uh, yeah, pennies per, per meter. But this isn't even that, it's ancient glass. This is absolutely filthy, this stuff. Um, to the point where this is um, essentially scrap. So what we need to do is first of all clean it up, then we're gonna cut it into little fragments. 
when she did like this, she just got a glass knife, put a bit of a scratch on her. And you lick it and just break it. So here we've got a load of pieces that have been meticulously scrubbed up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make nozzles out of these guys. Okay, so this is the basic setup. What you got here is obviously the oxygen propane torch. You put some glass in there and it goes very orange. These glasses here, which you normally I would wear so I can see what's going on in the flame, are actually on the microscope here. The microscope such that you can actually see what's going on here. Because this does get rather fiddly, this sort of thing. Um, and it should focus just in front. So it's actually quite a subtle thing to try and get all this to work. Oh, a little bit high. Get a little bit of a human hair and that is my capillary as you can see it gets down thinner than a human hair pretty bloody quick so so we decided where to cut this guy I'm gonna cut it about there Sounds good. Nice scratched. Like um, broken. Super. Done. Finished. There's a bit of a straight glass in there. Look at that. Nice and clean. Jet. So that's my nozzle tip and my hair. Let's put some water through this. There you go. That is one jet. Uh, yeah. Significantly thinner than a human hair. And shut up so well. Let's just try on a black background. There you go. And this is what they look like when they're working. And you just go pow. Oops, and there's water on the lens. Let's show that I speed of these jets, they're actually quite impressive. Beautiful little micro chat. So that's just a little glimpse into some of the problems you can come across in science research, what it can actually look like. The x-ray beam time is scheduled for just over a month and success is by no means guaranteed. I mean, we're not even entirely sure what we'll find. I mean, like I was saying before, we wouldn't call it research if we knew what we were doing. But it's always kind of like that when you're trying to do something that no one's ever tried before. But if it works and it's interesting, I'll be sure to let you know what we find. So if you enjoyed this video, give this video a like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if you really like this video, consider supporting this channel on Patreon. Because what you see here, that's my home and that's your Patreon dollars at work.